Open your Bibles this morning to the first chapter of the book of Daniel. If you're scrambling to think, okay, that's hard to find, it is hard to find. You know, it's easy to tell you Genesis or Revelation, start at the front or start at the back. But when you start getting into some of the major and minor prophets, it becomes more difficult. If you know where Isaiah is, you can go from Isaiah to Jeremiah to Lamentations to Ezekiel to Daniel. You can move from those larger prophets to the book of Daniel, which Daniel is placed in the prophetic section of our English Bible, as we will see here in a moment. We'll read the first two verses and give an introduction to this book. Daniel chapter 1 and the first two verses. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Let us now pray over the word. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your blessing of this text. And thank you, Lord, for the blessing that we have to study your word. I pray, Lord, that as we begin this book of the Bible, that you would bless us with a special blessing, both to see your sovereignty, to find hope for the individual, but also, Lord, to have further confidence in your word. Gracious God, we thank you for every book but pray that you would bless this present study. In Christ's name I pray, and amen. Here in the book of Daniel, you're not going to fully understand it without an introduction, as it were, to the book. Now, some books you may begin to read, and there's not much reason to go back and try to understand the setting. Now, I would disagree with that, but you can still understand certain aspects of the book. Proverbs is one, for instance, that you can read through and just about get wisdom from it, not have to understand the context of every single passage. Psalms, hit or miss, depending on what you're reading. It's good to know the context, but at the same time, you can read them and get enjoyment. Some of this book is going to be lost on you, if you don't have some type of historical grounding of the setting of Daniel, both as a person and as a book. Daniel is one of those compelling books that gives you both a sense of fear and wonder. When I was explaining to somebody here recently that I was going to begin preaching through the book of Daniel, they laughed and said, oh, an easy one. And what they meant by that is it's not an easy one. When you start getting into the meat of chapter 7 and see one horn raise above the others, you're like, what does that mean? Or one beast come out of the sea. Or when you get to chapter 9 and you see the 70 weeks of Daniel, which I hold as 70 weeks of years, but we'll get there when we get there. You can get through this and come up with different ideas of what it may mean. Because what you're seeing in the book of Daniel is God through Daniel giving a testimony of some 400 years of history and also the entirety of our entire human history to the second coming. So what you see is primarily multiple different views of Kingdoms coming, kingdoms going, Christ coming, a rock cut out of the mountain, smashes all the kingdoms, and you can say, you're giving us a lot right now. I am, but we're going to get into it in more depth as we go chapter to chapter. But also in chapter 12, as you see a general judgment being portrayed, you can see not only the kingdoms of the next 400 years from Daniel's point, but also you see the final consummation of all things as the kingdom is finally fulfilled. Daniel's one of those books that can give us a sense of both fear, but will also strengthen our faith in the inspiration and preservation of Scripture. 
This book has caused so much alarm among modern skeptics that it strengthens the believer so much and in their ins- belief in the inspiration of Scripture that modern skeptics have tried to place it not dated in the time of Daniel, as we'll get into two in a minute. But if you study the book, it gives you a great sense that you know that if this book is true, which we believe it is, it testifies that God is the God that knows the end from the beginning, that works his will among the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of earth, and none can question his authority. And it gives us the blessing of knowing that we are in his hand. Some have paralleled this as being the Old Testament equivalent of the book of Revelation. That doesn't give you much assurance of the study, does it? (laughs) You can say, well, that's not going to help me out much. But the idea of it being akin to Revelation, one, it gives some sense of history, as Daniel does. If you study the book of Daniel and see the multiple sevens and how it is showing a climactic approach to history that is met with final victory. Same thing happens in the book of Daniel. You constantly see a climactic build of history met with the kingdom of God and final consummation of his kingdom. And even though it has been compared both, I believe it was that I read this morning with uh, the JFB commentary with Revelation and also it's compared to it because just like Revelation gives both a big picture It also gives small images. You know, if you study the book of Revelation, there are certain things that is a one-to-one ratio meaning something else. Now, what it means, I'm not sure. I hold the view that we'll know when it happens, right? (laughs) When we look back from eternity and say, oh, now I know what that meant. (laughs) You know, that's why there's a lot of liberty to Revelation because we're going to look back and say, okay, we were all wrong, right? (laughs) Every single one of us was wrong. Well, with Daniel, we are not given that glimpse where we can look back and say that's what it meant. But at the same time, you're given a big picture of the kingdom of God and God wins. And also you're given a picture of the small types of what's going to come. So Daniel, like Revelation, gives us the same view. Daniel being that book that causes some sense of wonder and honestly some sense of frustration when you study it. And my hope is that as we study through this book, it won't give us that type of frustration. The first time I studied through this book as a pastor studying through it to preach it was in Oxford, Mississippi, probably somewhere around 2013, if I can remember correctly, so some 10 years ago. When I read through this book and studied through it, I believe we started preaching through this directly after we went through 1 John. And so we went from a very pretty easy to understand book to the book of Daniel, and I was intimidated but excited. And when I got done, I told my brother, you've got to study through the book of Daniel, because that's what it did to me. It made me go, oh my goodness, everyone needs to read this. But I'm like that with every single series. When we went through Mark, I was like, everybody should study through Mark. It's probably just my excited nature. But in reality, Daniel is one of those books that when you actually study it in depth, it does not make you go, I want to stop. I know sometimes when you do a one-year reading plan and you hit Leviticus or Numbers, whew, it gets hard. You hit Ezekiel, wow. <laughs> A will inside a will and a bow in the air and a throne with somebody behind the throne, you know, and you're like a chariot of fire and you know, a beast, uh, you know, and you're just like, what's going on? And then the valley of dry bones and everything else in Ezekiel, I, I get it. I hope that when you study through the book of Daniel and as we go through this, when we hit the end, your heart is strengthened. Your heart is strengthened. And there's a reason why it will be. And to know the reason why it will be, you have to know the context of what's happening. And I'll tell you, we won't hit everything that's happening this morning. If I was being honest, an introduction to Daniel would probably take three messages if I was going to give you everything that was happening in the world simultaneous to just the first two verses and everything that has led up to this point. But I will say that we will hit the high points this morning to give us some context. 
The book is believed to be written around 530 B.C. 530 B.C. This would be at the end of Daniel's tenure in Babylon and now under the rule of Persia. Some date it later being in the second century by critical scholars. This was first promoted by a skeptic in early church history and then just completely forgotten about because everybody said, you're wrong because Christians historically have held that this book was written at the end of the 70-year period in which that they were in Babylonian captivity at the end of Daniel's tenure and written as he was looking back writing this history around 530 B.C., that being before Christ. So he is somewhere around 530 B.C. writing, not 2nd century. The reason that skeptics had said, well, it has to be 2nd century is because they looked at the book and said there's too many prophetic writings in here. Nobody could have looked 400 years ahead and have been able to name not only... Not only that something would happen, but name the countries in which it would happen, as it not only names that there would be a kingdom come and a kingdom fall, but then it names some by name, naming Greece as being one that would come. And so when you see that, whether it be in chapter 1 or chapter 7, and you see that they call kingdoms coming and going, skeptics nowadays would look and say there is no possible way an individual in 530 could look and say Babylon would fall to the Persian, Empire, Persian Mede Empire, Persians would take over the Medes, <laughs> and then Greece would take over the Persians, and then Rome would take over them. There's no possible way that a person writing in 530 B.C. could know that, and I would, be, and I would say I agree. No person could know that, but God does because God works his will among the armies of heaven and Inhabitants of earth, as Nebuchadnezzar would find out soon in the book of Daniel. I agree. I can't know the future. But God does. You know, God kind of wrote the book, right? <laughs> his story, history, his story. I don't have to wonder if it is truly inspired if I have faith in a God who sees all things. Even some modern Christians who... I believe the term is open deists. They think that God does exist, but he knows just as little about the future as we do, and he's surprised just like we are. And I'm like, no, sir, he is not. Nothing has ever occurred to God. He's never been surprised. He knows all things exactly as they will be. Amen? He is the sovereign God of the universe. <laughs> he's not surprised. So when I look at this, I don't have to question if, this was written in 530 B.C. because I trust the God who existed before Genesis 1-1 when he created the heavens and the earth and set all things as they are. I don't have to wonder why. Because I believe in a sovereign God. That's why. Well, this happens in the first chapter the details really start in 605 B.C. This is really happening um, around 605 in chapter 1. And when you see chapter 1, when we envision what's happening in this book, we picture Daniel as some old individual. I shouldn't say that because some of you may be as old as him when he does write the book. But a man well stricken in years, as the Bible would call it. And so a man well stricken in years, we envision Daniel to be all the way from chapter 1. And every time they picture what is happening to Daniel, they picture an aged man well stricken in years, white as the Bible says, hoary hair, just like the frost of the ground, solid white. But in reality, in chapter 1, we're seeing a 15-year-old boy. A 15-year-old boy. At the very beginning of a 70-year time period of captivity. Daniel's 15 in chapter 1. He's not 85. Now, at the very end of the captivity, as we'll study what the captivity meant in just a minute, at the end of the captivity, he's around 85 years old. He spends some 70 years in Babylonian captivity. He spends a long time period. In Babylon, 
under their rule, then under the Medes and Persians, before they're released by the sovereign providence of God, but when he starts, he's 15. So this book is a book that gives hope for those well-stricken in years, chapter 9 specifically, to show the place of the aged in the kingdom of God. Because when we get there, it's one of my favorite places because that's a man well stricken in years and he's still studying the word and he's still praying and he's still investing in the kingdom of God. He knew his place was to be investing in the kingdom of God, yet this is also a book for the youth because you're seeing a group of adolescents dropped into a pagan culture. Dropped into a culture that hated them. So at age 15, what we're seeing here, as you see in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. King of Babylon. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with the part of the vessels of the house of God, and he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So here in this moment, what you're seeing is God's judgment upon Israel. This was prophesied of by the prophet Jeremiah. Now, this is some of the various individuals who are contemporaries of Daniel, Jeremiah being one of them, Habakkuk being another, Habakkuk being the one that said, Lord, how long do you wait to judge Israel? And when he says, oh, I'm already preparing a people, the Chaldeans are coming. And then Habakkuk says, whoa, 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 Lord, not just how long, but why this way? And so Habakkuk also being a contemporary of Daniel, this is before they're brought back in and begin to rebuild the temple. Daniel is one of the captivity prophets. The pre-captivity being Isaiah, you'll remember him and him saying it would happen. Jeremiah saying you're about to be destroyed, giving lamentations to the people. And here leading up to Daniel, which was one of those captivity prophets. Well, in the book of Jeremiah, I'm going to read to you just a few verses. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verses 11 and 12. This is Jeremiah Speaking condemnation, notice this all the way back in verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Notice how he calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. That's important, as we'll see in a moment. Nebuchadnezzar, his servant. And will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the soundness of of the millstones and the light of the candle, and the whole land shall be desolation, and an astonishment of these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolation. Likewise, in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10 reads similar, similarly, when he says, For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years are accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. So we see both the judgment in taking them to Babylon and the sovereignty of God in delivering them from Babylon. Why were they being taken to Babylon? It almost sounds arbitrary. Seventy years, what did they do? Well, you could really say they've done a lot. <laughs> and they didn't learn from their big sister up north, the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom, which was most of the tribes that had broken away after Solomon 
and his children began to fight, and you had the kingdoms separated, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom being destroyed by the Assyrians. Now you are having the southern kingdom not learning from the northern kingdom and continuing in idolatry. It's interesting, you had the northern kingdom, which had bad king after bad king after bad king. A really cool uh, book that you can use, and I don't agree with a lot of its New Testament theology when it pertains to salvation. Y'all know we believe in the sovereignty of God. It leans more towards a different direction. But Haley's Handbook, if you've never used that as a study source, has a list of all the kings in the Old Testament. Haley's Handbook is like one of the standards for Old Testament studies. It gives great summaries, and it gives really good, like, just information. And so in there, it gives a list of the northern and southern kings, and it shows you the bad kings, and it will say good or bad beside the king's name and so as you look at the very beginning of the history it'll say in the northern kingdom bad 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 or evil 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 (laughs) and then when you get to the southern kingdom you can see it say good bad good bad good bad good bad good bad so the northern kingdom had bad after bad the southern had good bad good bad almost sounds a lot like presidential elections right (laughs) good bad good bad good bad depending on what side you view it from. Well, the reason it was 70 years of all of their idolatry, of all of their wickedness, of having their children pass through the fire, meaning that they sacrificed their children to false gods in fire, they were commanded in the Old Testament law to have the land sit dormant one year every seventh year to let it rest to be for the glory of God y'all remember in the wilderness God gave double manna on the sixth day so that they would not have to gather it on the seventh there's a special there's a special blessing God gives to us in rest on the seventh day and whereas I'm not a strict Sabbatarian as some of the former Baptists of old who were influenced by the Puritans that would say that you can't do anything but just go to church and think about the Bible all the seventh day. I would fail every single day. (laughs) NASCAR comes on and I'm watching NASCAR, right? (laughs) It just happens, you know, on Sundays. I I don't know why. I just like the sound of the cars. John Calvin, even it's reported that you could find him on Sundays bowling after church. They had a type of bowling that they would do. So even John Calvin, who was not a Baptist, thought it okay to do some things other than just worship and then sit stoically staring at each other. But there is something special about the seventh. God has commanded praise. He commanded praise in the wilderness. He commanded praise for them on, again, their Sabbath on Saturday. Christians, what we call the Christian Sabbath being Sunday as commemoration of the resurrection of the, um, resur- uh, commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a special blessing God promises on that seventh. They were to rest the seventh day and they were to let the land rest on the seventh to his glory. They were supposed to save up and then let it rest and live off what they had on that seventh year. Interestingly enough, it was also a blessing to the land. If you've never done any farming, which I've tried before as a child, my granddad, some of y'all may remember who was called in Leeds, Alabama, the tomato man. I don't know if y'all remember him off Roosevelt and President's Drive, but if you drove past his house, you could see 20-foot-tall tomato vines held up on two-by-fours. He was the tomato man of Leeds, Morris Croft, never smiled, but could plant a tomato, and he had me planting some, and I was never good at it. But I always saw him do it, and he'd have to replenish his soul continuously. Why? Because... As the nutrients are brought out of the ground from plants, they drain the ground of its resources. So to let, that's why uh, in Mississippi in the Delta, where we lived, and their mascot is the Delta Dragon because their mosquitoes are the size of birds <laughs> and come about the same as flocks. And, but the, flo- uh, the crops that you have there would change every year because different crops brought out different proteins and replenished the soil in every way in different ways and so the idea was God demanded that 
Israel, give him his glory and let the land rest. But God's plan also included replenishing the ground. Imagine that. God demands his glory, but in giving him his glory, what he is commanding is also giving the ground rest. Sounds a lot like us. What he commands, we may think is a burden, but what it does is actually replenish us. I was talking to somebody here recently that hasn't been in church in multiple years. It's probably been a four years they were hurt at church, and I get that. You know, sheep can bite. <laughs> and sometimes you got wolves dressed up as sheep, and they bite even harder, and it hurts people. But I was talking to them about how, okay, do you have a go-to person? Well, yes, all right. Do you have a go-to community such as church? And they're like, they just kind of blushed. I was like, get to church. <laughs> Pick one. There's one every quarter mile. <laughs> Preferably pick a sound one, <laughs> but pick one and get there. Why? Because, yes, God demands his glory, but also it gives us what we need to be replenished, just as the ground does. And so God's judgment on them, they did not let the land sit dormant 70 times. So for the 70 times that they did not let the land set dormant, what happened? God said, for every year you did not let the land rest, you will be in Babylonian captivity. This teaches us a principle in this, in that God will get his glory. Someone may withhold the glory, whether it be a believer who refuses at the moment of sin to glorify God, God will get his glory in judgment. Or the wicked who will not bow their knee and in hatred spit at the idea and righteousness of God, God will get his glory, as we see in Philippians chapter 2, when every knee shall bow. Praise God, we have a God that gets his glory. (laughs) We don't have a weak God that's not going to be glorified. Whether it's now or later, God will get his glory. Glory. God's got this. Interesting, and you'll see this later in Daniel chapter 9. You see Daniel reading, and it's probably going to be from Jeremiah chapter 25 or chapter 29. I've always loved that scene because you're reading the Bible and reading about somebody that's reading the Bible. (laughs) I've always found that kind of interesting. But here he is in there for 70 years. 70 years in which was judgment against Israel. Well, he tells them there in Daniel chapter 1 that this is a moment in which Babylon is coming to besiege Jerusalem. This was actually Neo-Babylon, as we call it, or the Chaldean Empire. Old Babylon, which you may remember of reading about all the way back in the book of Genesis in which they are building that tower and everybody's language is confounded. Old Babylon existed from about 1894 B.C. to 1595, and then you have some various empires existing from there. Then you have the Assyrian period, and the Assyrians were brutal. They actually created what was called proto-crucifixion, Um, which is where they would put spikes all along the road going into their capital, and they would put their enemies on a spike and just let them sink. (laughs) So as you go into the city, what you're doing is saying, all right, don't break the laws here, right? (laughs) Don't break the laws because I see what they do to people that break the laws. And so the Assyrian Empire was brutal. It was brutal. They destroyed the northern kingdom. So you have that time period in which the Assyrians ruled and reigned, and then you have the Neo or New Babylonian Empire, which was the Chaldean Empire, beginning around 626 and lasting till around 539, in which the Persian Empire would then begin to rise. And if you are ever one that watches pop culture, it's a horrible movie with horrible violence, but the movie 300 was during the Persian Empire, during probably the time period of Esther. And it's believed that King Xerxes that went and fought the 300 was the same king that was with Esther. Interesting history. I could bore you all all day. But you're seeing the time frame, right? You're seeing the time frame. Old Babylon, Assyrians, now you have the new Babylon. They were known for the Hanging Gardens, one of the seven wonders of the world, the gardens that have their own basically irrigation system. 
Babylon was a beautiful, beautiful place. Babylon, it's said to have walls 300 feet high and 70 feet wide. It was that, I believe it was 70 feet. I was writing that off of memory. I probably should have looked that up before I said it. But 300 feet high and 70 feet wide. And the idea was to where you were able to ride three chariots wide around the entire city defending it as people are trying to besiege it. The walls could not be penetrated. That's why when you begin to get into the book itself, you're going to see that the Persians can't get over the wall, so they're going to get under the wall. They laid three sieges on Jerusalem. Three different sieges. The first one, they began to siege the city, and what they did then was they would take their prisoners of war. They would take their prisoners of war. The first ones they would take would be those that are wise, those that are brilliant. Well, I'm left out. (laughs) Second siege, the strong men. Well, I'm still left out. I'm still at Jerusalem. Then the third siege, they got the rest. They would have probably gotten me on the third siege. Ain't that smart? Ain't that strong? But now I get to go to Babylon. (laughs) And so they take the first, second, and third sieges. The third one, they completely lay waste to Israel. And think about this. From this point, even all the way until the time period of the Romans, Israel is now what's called a vassal state. And what is meant by that is they are a state in which though they are allowed to rule as a sovereign group, they are still paying taxes to and answering to another. For their disobedience to God, since God, they refused as king, they now would be under the bondage of another. That's a sobering thought For any group of people, any nation, that is a sobering thought to churches, to Christians, that if we will not have God as our king, it will soon become that another will rule over you. No different than the book of Judges. Every single time that a judge was raised up and died, then all of a sudden you blink and it says the very next verse, and the people did that which was right in their own eyes. (laughs) Every single time. You know, I, I, I really lean what's called libertarian. You know, just get off my lawn, let me be me, you be you, leave me alone. <laughs> That's kind of where I lean most of the time, just leave me alone. But then I see that apart from a Christian conscience constrained by the word of God and God's ethics, it just falls. That's why God ordained government to be a terror to evil. And unfortunately, commands us to pay taxes. <laughs> unfortunately. Three sieges, the wise, the strong, and the rest. Well, in those sieges, typically of that day and age, what would happen is you would have defeat would show the supremacy of one god over another to the point to where when somebody besieged another group, you'll remember that they gouged out the eyes of the king, but they would also take them back to where they were from in a manner which showed the superiority of what they thought was the victory of their god. For instance, if their god was a fish god, Dagon, Dagon of Babylon, how would they bring them back? They would put hooks in their mouth and make them go all the way back thousands of miles to their kingdom like fish, showing the superiority of what they thought was a victory of their god. So as we read here, in their mind, Nebuchadnezzar thought, our god has defeated your god. Whenever a nation would overrule another nation, they would say, our God has won. You'll remember before this, the very beginning of the time of the prophets with Elijah, there was a battle of gods. They built an altar. They covered it in water. And they began to cry out and say, you know, they cry out to their God. And Elijah starts to ask, is your God sleeping? Is he on a trip? Is he in the bathroom? Where is your God? And nothing happens. Then all of a sudden, Elijah calls out to his God, and fire comes down from heaven and consumes them all. And the idea is one God more superior than the other. Same thing happened when one nation would beat another. And so in their view... Jehovah, the God of Israel, has been defeated. In their view, they've defeated God. Notice in verse 1, 
In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. You have the historical context. In verse 2, you have what's really happening. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Nebuchadnezzar came, besieged Jerusalem, then Daniel says, but what's really happening is God is sovereign. He has given over Israel to the Babylonians. And even though you can see Nebuchadnezzar takes the vessels that were in the temple and puts them in their own temple to show how they think that they have defeated God, what is really happening is God is saying, I am so suffering this wickedness as my instrument and as my wrath. The reason I use the word suffer because it means permit with annoyance. God does not condone sin. However, this was the sword of God in which he would go into and destroy Israel in his wrath and in judgment. And then, as you saw in the Jeremiah chapter 25, he likewise, at the end of the 70 years, would then judge Babylon for their wickedness. <laughs> God judges their wickedness. But what you see is God is still in control. God is in control. Now this book, even though you see it's written under the name Daniel, and later it speaks of Daniel speaking of himself, I do want to mention before we get to its synopsis and pur purpose that um, we believe that it is written by the book of Daniel. Jesus names this as written by Daniel in Matthew 24 and verse 15 on the um, sermon... Uh, the Olivet Discourse, I had to get the right word, the Olivet Discourse. Um, the Olivet Discourse, Jesus names this as being his. The word Daniel itself means God is judge. God is my judge. Ezekiel linked, uh, linked Daniel with Noah and Job in Ezekiel chapter 14, in verse 14 and verse 20. Daniel himself, as we see what the synopsis and purpose is, Daniel himself was not necessarily a prophet in profession. What do I mean by that? He was a prophet, but he was not a prophet in profession. Isaiah was a prophet in profession. Elijah, Elisha, both were prophets in profession. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was a prophet in profession. Daniel was a bureaucrat, a politician, a servant that God used where he was at as a prophet. We'll see this as we get into chapter 1 next week, how God uses you where you're at. You know, sometimes I feel like, am I really doing anything and making any type of difference? <laughs> Does my life matter at all? Does my life have any meaning? Daniel, who was a servant, a eunuch, to the king, a bureaucrat, God used as a prophet. And this is one of the few individuals, one of the few individuals, too, that I have found, you may be able to find more, that the word of God says not a single negative thing about. I was talking to somebody the other day, and we were talking about how very... Many ministers have past lives. One of our um, nurses who is over the entire district harasses me because she graduated two years after me, and she knows a lot about me, so she picks at me a good bit. And so I was, we were having Saints for Christ the other day at Oval Middle School, and I was talking to the minister, and he said he really wasn't converted until he was in his college years, and we were talking about that, and he said, you know, it's just like the Bible. The Bible doesn't say, you know, all the saints have a rap sheet, and I was like, wait, all but two, <laughs> and I hate to be the actually guy, you know, but I, in all honesty, there's only two people in the Bible. I can't find a single negative word said about, and that is King Josiah started, I think, at age eight reigning and then killed by the Egyptians. God took his life before he would see the judgment of God because Josiah was such an excellent individual in the 
Old Testament, always loved that name, could never convince Becca of the name Josiah, still think it's a great name, maybe I'll get a grandbaby with that name, I love that name, and then the second individual, Daniel, Daniel this bureaucrat, working diligently in the king's house as a servant, God used where he was at. In circumstances that we would think be unprofitable for God using us then, not the best circumstances. So what we're going to see is not only God is the God of the nations as we would see it, but we're going to see that he is going to become the God not only of the macro, the large setting, but he's the God of the micro setting interacting with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and Darius. Throughout this book, he's going to be interacting with all, Daniel being that prophet. I say in passing that we consider this a prophetic book. It is in the prophetic section of our English Bible, but in the Hebrew Bible, it's actually in the third section after the Torah, the prophets, then you have the third section, which is the writings, and so that's where he's at there. Daniel wrote this whole narrative. Daniel was a prophet, and Daniel was an individual that God used in a mighty way in a place we would not expect him to be used in Babylonian captivity, and we're seeing that God is still God in captivity. Now I want us to finally get to the synopsis and purpose. This book is written in two sections. The first section is written primarily to Babylon, and that's why starting in, I believe, chapter 2 all the way through chapter 6, it's written in Aramaic. It's one of the largest sections of Aramaic in the Old Testament. And then chapter 7 through 12 is written in Hebrew. This is teaching us that God is not just the God of Israel, but he's the God of Babylon, Babylon submits to God just as Israel submits, submits to God. Just because they destroyed the temple and destroyed Israel and took these vessels of worship into their temple of God does not mean God has been overthrown. God's judgment was fulfilled in them destroying the temple. And so God, in showing us, even in the language he used, it's showing us that he is the God of both Babylon and the Hebrews. It's also showing us that his message is not just for the Jews, but it's also for the Gentiles. This shows us that God is sovereign over nations and individuals. Second, this is going to give us an account of Daniel's life in captivity. We're going to see a 15-year-old boy, I say boy, at that time period, Jews considered them a man. <laughs> now you're a boy until you're like 30. <laughs> you know, failure to launch in your mama's basement and still just living there. You're a baby until you're 30. I'm sorry, kids, when you hit age 18, that you are getting out. <laughs> you are going to college, and you, you know, my mama always said she didn't, she raised us to leave. That was the way she <laughs> always said it, raised us to leave. I am getting out. Failure to launch. That was actually a movie a while back. And Daniel started out at age 15 in captivity, and it goes from a macro setting showing God the judge of Israel, God the judge of Babylon, God who gave Judah into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. It moves straight from that point to then the king's chamber. as the king is going to command certain individuals to be chosen, to be brought and reprogrammed into Babylonian culture. And so the book of Daniel follows the pattern of both the individual and the nation, both individual history and world history. Why is this important? Because sometimes we look as at the history of the world and say God's hand is in it. And then we forget God's hand in our own experience. Sometimes we may look at God's blessing of my life and know that God has protected me and is covering me and that he is blessing me and keeping me. But then when I look at the general 
overwhelming consensus of the news and think, though God protects me, what is happening with the world? And the book of Daniel shows us that God is both the God of nations and history, and he is also the God of individuals. Just as it goes from Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 5, or Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and it's showing us like nations, and it's showing us world history, whether it be the flood, or whether it be Babylon, and then you get all the way to the end of chapter 10, and it goes from this view of human history, and then it focuses in on one individual, Abraham, and shows how God called him out of the um, Ur of the Chaldees from his family and told him to go into a nation in which he would show him. God is the God of nations and he is the God of the individual. He's the God that handed the nation of Judah into the hand of Babylon and he's the God that protects Daniel and these three Hebrew men in captivity. He's the God that keeps them the entire time. He's the God that hands Babylon over to Persia, and he's the God that sends the angel to Daniel at the end of the 70 years. He's the God the entire time. He's God. He's with the leaders of the nation. He's with the mayor. He's wish, with his people over the entirety of the globe. He's with them in communist countries. He's with them in democratic countries. He's with them in war-torn countries. He's with them in countries that see peace. He's with them in poverty. He's with them in prosperity. He's with them as a group, and he's with them as an individual. He's with his people. Sometimes we lose sight of that. I can envision that right at this moment, them being pulled in captivity, I would have lost sight of that. I think we've all lost sight of that over the past couple of years, that God is the God who rules and reigns. When things seem to be going south, we wonder what's happening. And I constantly remind myself that it is the sovereignty of God that is the pillow in which I lay my head at night and sleep. Remember when we first had children, that really pushed that button. You lay down at night and you're thinking about all the things that could happen to him. You wake up multiple times. You walk in and you peek over that crib. You see if they're still breathing. You put your hand on their chest to see if they're breathing. Why? Because you're scared to death as a parent that God has given you something so small. I mean, I break dinner plates and God gave me a living, breathing being. <laughs> God's going to give me that? You want me to take care of this? We can't keep a plant alive. <laughs> Yet God has blessed us to keep three children you know, but we worry. We're scared. And if I was brought into captivity after siege, after siege, after siege, if I was brought into the king's court, if I was brought in to serve him, I would think we lost. But Daniel's view is different. And God shows us here that it's different. In these two sections, both of individual prophecy of nations and prophecy of the kingdom of God and prophecy of Christ and prophecy of the forgiveness of our sins, we're also seeing how believers in the one true and living God are able to handle living in an ungodly, Christ-hating culture. So this is meant to encourage those in persecution and it's meant to give hope to the discouraged. How does it do this? You know, it's one thing to say, feel better, it's going to be better. Well, no, it may get worse. <laughs> I never say things could be worse because then they do. Both in Rebecca's line of work and mine, we say never say the C word. You're like, what's the C word? Calm. <laughs> never say it's calm. <laughs> and I know there's nothing about that. There really isn't. It's just some false sense of superstition, but we're superstitious. You know, I'll quote Michael Scott. I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. <laughs> you know, it's I, that's Steve Carell from The Office that looks just like my brother. <laughs> you know, I'm not superstitious. I'm a little stitious. Don't say the C word, calm, because then a full moon's going to be around the corner or a blood moon or a front's going to come in. Or it's going to be moving from winter to spring during a full moon while a front comes in and another front's leaving. And it's going to stay that way for a month. 
Anybody that's worked in education or a hospital or work with people knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's, it's real, folks. Ask my dad who's a police officer. You know, it's easy to say be encouraged or say find hope, but how do you do it? And it does it in this way. It instills faith in God's sovereignty even when it looks like he's lost. Because they didn't just lose. God was still in control. And with God handing them over to the king of Babylon, they would not have been handed over. God's hand was in it the entire time. God was still the sovereign ruler and judge. God did not cause the wickedness of Babylon, nor did he cause the wickedness of Judah. But God was sovereign over both. And this allows us to have faith in God even when we feel like we've lost. It also shows us God's unfailing purposes. Whether it's in chapter 2, the stone cut out of the mountain, or whether it is in chapter 7, when the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days and a kingdom is given unto him, or it's chapter 9, in which we see those 70 weeks, and in the middle of the 70th week, we see the sacrifice of our sins on Jesus Christ. We see hundreds of of years, even thousands as we get to chapter 12 of human history of which we see that God's unfailing purposes will come to fruition. And then finally, how does he show us that God's unfailing purposes come to fruition? How? How does he instill hope? How does he give peace? How does he encourage? In our modern day, this would be something that would just escape most people or offend He does so through theology. Now, I know often we want the feeling of goosebumps on the back of our neck through the best chord on the best electric and acoustic guitar. And the same eight words said over and over again through 11 lines of repetition. They call them 711 music because it's seven words said 11 times. <laughs> and you just say the same thing over and again until everybody's just worked up and they just feel great about themselves. But then you leave and you can think, yeah, that, those people, you know, that happened in my youth too. We had people that would get in a big way. That's what they called it back then. They'd get in a big way and just be up there shucking the corn, as Southerners would call it. They'd be up there really preaching. And you don't, you'd leave. And I remember one time, I won't name the sermon because somebody may listen to this and know the sermon I'm talking about from a different state at a certain meeting and he was just up there shucking the corn and then everybody walked away saying how great a meeting it was and then you asked them well what do you preach about I don't know but it was good (laughs) well that don't do nothing saying I don't know but it was good don't leave me with nothing that's like cotton candy it tasted good but there ain't nothing left in my stomach I love eastern candy but I'll tell you those Whataburger little squishy gummies don't do nothing for my stomach I need substance And yes, I stole every single one out of my kids' baskets. They ain't got one left. (laughs) Not a Whataburger left in there. They didn't know this, but at 10 o'clock at night when the lights were off, I was stealing them. But you know what? I was hungry five minutes later. It did nothing for me. Nothing. How did God, through Daniel, instill hope and encouragement into them? Ultimately, It was by pointing them to the work of Christ and his kingdom. A kingdom that was a rock cut out of mountain that would destroy all other kingdoms that oppose itself against God. A kingdom that was given to the Son at his ascension in which he gives to us so that we may dwell in it in peace. Our Christ who was sacrificed and prophesied of to take away our sins in Daniel chapter 9, and then finally in Daniel chapter 12, knowing that not only is his kingdom given and his kingdom is eternal, but likewise we will be standing before him as he separates his sheep from the goats in that last day, and the righteous will dwell with him forevermore. How does he instill hope in these believers during 70 years of captivity? How does he do it? Because as we see in Jeremiah chapter 29, where he is telling them that he would deliver them out, he also tells them as he gives them that focus that they are to seek peace in that city, he tells them likewise that to them, 
that he has an expected end. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11, after we read where he would deliver them out of Babylon, he says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. This is what my friend Marty Hoskins calls a verse that people use as refrigerator theology. What he means by that is you take this verse out and you put it on the fridge and you walk by it every day and slowly it loses its context. (laughs) God has an expected end for me. I'm going to have that Ferrari is, or I don't, what what is the car my kids talk about? Is it a McLaren that y'all talk about? Uh, I forget which one it is, but we drive by and they have great... Uh, visions of grandeur of which that they will have cars when they grow up. And I hate to tell you, but I had those two, and now I drive a minivan. So just know, <laughs> just know it's coming for you too, buddy. But, you know, it's, you know we think of this expected end. I'm going to get everything I want. But you know what this expected end was? Seventy years of captivity and the deliverance back into his land and temple. What is our expected end? It's a life in which we would glorify God under captivity, and then one day he would deliver us into his very presence, into the presence of our redemption, our redeemer, Jesus Christ. What is our hope? What is our encouragement? It's that regardless of how bad this world gets and how overthrown we feel in life, ultimately, God is in control. He is our victor. And we will reign with him in eternity. That's the encouragement and hope he gives to the captive. That even in captivity, God is on his throne, and one day, whether it's in this life or in the next, we will be delivered. Daniel really is a book for all ages. Why? Because God is the God not only of nations and world history, but God is the God of the individual, in which he gives them hope in this book, during 70 years of captivity, as they face lions, as they face a fiery furnace, as they face ungodliness and wickedness, God is with them. And God is with those that commit themselves to him. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for this wonderful book that you have inspired and preserved, that you have blessed us to have a small introduction to this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us to be able to study it with fervency, energy, and Lord, see your hand not only in human history, but also in our individual path, and not only in our individual lives, but Lord, also in the course of nations. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us with a sense of peace in your sovereignty to know that whatever captivity that we face here as we walk through the valley and the shadow of death and as though we walk in this wilderness land, that you would bless us to be able to be guided by smoke by day and fire by night, knowing that you are with us. Gracious Lord, encourage us in our walk through this upcoming study. In your name I pray, and amen.